you know, we're kind of taking big topics and we're trying to tackle them in one session, which is impossible to do. Uh, today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to the hearts of everybody uh, who thinks about, uh, you know, when, when Joseph Smith records one of his instances of the first vision, he says, I was struck and concerned for the welfare of my immortal soul. And don't we all share that inclination? Uh, where are we going? We talk so much about this plan of salvation. Uh, and today I wanted to talk about that word, salvation, what it means. And we'll, we'll attempt over the next hour to, uh, to define that and to work through it and to talk about the terms and conditions upon which salvation is uh, received and offered. Um, and we'll rely upon the revelations to expand our mind. Uh, again, we may start with some biblical passages, but we'll get pretty quick into the revelations of the restoration. We'll look at uh, the thinking of Joseph Smith on the topic uh, and other modern-day prophets. So we've got quite a task ahead of us today to, um, you know, to examine. And again, I'll probably repeat comments here for the benefit of those on Zoom, um, and we'll, uh, we'll just march right ahead. So it, Ray wants to know if it's going to be depressing. I think that depends on, uh, on you, Ray. No. Um, <laughs> No, all gospel topics are edifying, if we can get the Spirit of the Lord to cooperate with us. Um, let's talk about this. Let's define salvation a little bit. And I, I want to use the, the scriptures to do that. Um, but uh, let me begin here with a quote from the prophet Joseph Smith. Salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, in nothing else, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it but himself or one like him. So Joseph Smith makes this statement that salvation rests in exalted beings. And ultimately, no one shares that unless they share the attributes and experience of a, of a saved being. Um, you know, what we've done in this class is we've kind of tried to start with the gospel it was, as it was preached at least as early as Christ's day, and then shown how some of that knowledge was lost, and then again restored. Um, there was this, there is this doctrine, this, if you recognize this word, theosis, uh, which is simply a word that means the process of becoming like God. Uh, and this is not a doctrine that is commonly held in Christian, you know, Christianity, as you know. Uh, you Latter-day Saints um, are the target of such productions as the God-makers, um, because you're unique in, in the belief that you can actually progress line upon line and light upon light and grace for grace until you achieve the status of a God. But that's, in fact, uh, a biblical and a early Christian father doctrine that was lost through the Middle Ages, through the, through the evolving apostasy, right? And what I, what I thought was interesting uh, this morning was, let's just examine a few. Again, when I talk about the early Christian fathers, these are those who were not apostles. These are those who came after the martyrdom of the original 12, but who inherited the traditions of the apostles, were part of the early church, and they were in that transition period, and they were trying to, they had lost authority, and yet they had love for the revealed word, as they had heard from the, from the prophets and apostles who had taught them. One of them was Irenaeus. You probably uh, recognize that name. Lived from what, uh, about 130 uh, AD to 200. Uh, these, these early Christian fathers went on to lay the foundation of theology for what is now the Catholic Church, all right? And from much of which their theological tradition um, descends. Irenaeus said, The word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who did, through his transcendent love, become what we are, that, we might, that he might bring us to be even what he himself is. All right? So Irenaeus says, that sounds a lot like Lorenzo Snow's couplet um, that we're going to get to in a minute about how, um, you know, God is as 
God was as we are, and we are as God. I always mess that up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. We'll read it. Um, let's read the next one. He also says, For we cast blame upon God because we have not been made gods from the beginning, but at first merely men, then at length gods. All right? Clement, another of the early Christian fathers, said, The word of God became man, that thou mayest learn how man may become God. There you go. There's another. Clement uh, says this. His beauty, the true beauty, for it is God, and that man becomes God, since God so wills. Uh, Well, I had about 15 or 20 of these early Christian fathers who had all said similar things. I've only captured, there's five or six statements here. Justin the Martyr says the same thing. But this was a commonly held view in the early church. So what happened? Where did it go? Where did the idea of theosis, becoming like God, disappear? Why is it that it's such a revolutionary thought that Joseph Smith expands and restores? And which, by the way, although it's in many of the revelations, he doesn't come out so explicitly and speak it until the mature years uh, of the kingdom in, in his ministry in Nauvoo. It's really the early 1840s that he begins to preach this publicly. But, but why is it that that doctrine, or how is it that that doctrine was lost to the ashes of the ages? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, Jane? Jane? What's that? Satan through the Nicene Creed. Well, yeah, so Jane brings up the, the Nicene Creed, and that's one, that, that, that certainly is one that we would look at. Um, the Nicene Creed happens in 325 AD, right? And this is the council uh, of the, of, that comes together and they debate things like the nature of God. This would extend to the Athanasian Creed and the Apostles' Creed. And these were the creeds that came out of the conventions of early scholars. After the apostles are gone, after revelation has largely institutionally ceased, you, they, we come together and we try and define who God is. And when you misdefine who God is, when you change the, narr- the, 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 the nature and the attributes and the character of God, all of the associated doctrines, which depend upon his nature, also by definition must change, right? Right? So if God says to us, you can become like me, you can have eternal life and dwell with me and be a joint heir with Christ, if he says in the Psalms that you are the sons of God and God's also, if the nature of God is changed, then we must come up with other explanations for that type of revelation. Right? Yeah, Maureen? So we can come to that point as well. Do you need to atone or not? The short answer is no, but we, we, can, we can pick that up uh, a little later. Um, but you have this question about, so let's get back to Nicaea before we leave this thought, which is when, when the Nicene Creed comes together, we now define God as a God that is ethereal, that fills the immensity of space, but fits in the corners of your heart. If there's any language that you can use to describe that being, he is not that thing, because you have mortal human capacity, and any concept that you have of him is insufficient, you see. And you have really what is a sort of a neoclassical Greek philosopher concept of who God is, and that's the tradition that these scholars got together and, and decided upon. And so, you know, God is not, there's a, there's a great distance that's placed between you and he. There's a great distance between our relatability with our Father in heaven. I mean, even the word Father intimates proximity, intimacy, familiarity, right? Uh, But when the creeds do that, they rob God of his body. They take the nature of God away from him. They define him as something that is not understandable, President Hinckley says, I have read the creeds, I do not and cannot understand them. And I I feel the same way. I've read these creeds, and they're very difficult to get your head around. They're abstract. 
Um, Now, if God is that thing, how do you become that thing? You don't. You're in different realms. You're in completely different, there's, there's a different type of a relationship that's defined between the God of the creeds and a father and mother type of relationship, you see. And so that's what happens through the Dark Ages. We begin to change the doctrine, and this idea of theosis disappears. Even though Clement and Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Theophilus and all these early Christian fathers that predate the creeds clearly believed in this doctrine. And so now we leap 1,800 years, and we come to the prophet Joseph Smith, and we begin to see this in all sorts of revelations. You'll see that most of the scriptures we'll review today come from the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, And probably the most clear understanding we can get from this comes from a sermon called the King Fall Discourse, which Joseph Smith gave in the last year of his life. All right? So, with that brief introduction, let's come back and say, what is salvation? What is exaltation? And the fact of the matter is, sometimes we mean different things when we use that word, right? So that's pro- we have a definitional problem that we've got to work through a little bit. And I think we ought to rely upon what the revelations say to begin to work through that. So let's, let's do that. Um, what is salvation? Or upon what does salvation rest? One... One passage that you would recognize right off the top is John 17, 3, right? Which says, this is life eternal, that they may know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. What is eternal life? Eternal life is to know God. It's to have a knowledge of God, who he is. Uh, Our revelations say that no man can be saved in ignorance. We must come to an understanding of the nature, the character, the attributes of deity, if we ever expect to obtain salvation. To know God. Well, how, brothers and sisters, do you come to know God? Does that happen in a book? It really doesn't. I mean, it begins there. We can, we, can, we, can, we can begin there. We can get ideas and concepts. But how do you come to know God, really? It's a sacred relationship. You begin to do the things that he does. You begin to see the way that he sees. You begin to enter into the relationships, the type of relationships that he exists in. And um, that knowledge compounds and it's added upon, and there's light and glory. And, uh, but to know God is the definition of eternal life in one instance, in John's instance, all right? Well, what else would we say? Um, well, the, what is at the focal point of salvation? We could easily answer that uh, by saying... In Psalms 27, 1, it reads, The Lord is my light and is my salvation. The Lord is my light and is my salvation. So, one thing we're learning is that we cannot remove the Lord or Jesus Christ from the equation of salvation. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Now, when I was a missionary in Taiwan, I would teach Buddhists and Taoists and people without any faith. And I remember teaching a young man who said, he said, I really like everything I'm hearing from you. He says, and that's one path. He says, says, eternal life is like your hand. And the middle of my palm is the destination. And I can come through Buddhism, or I can come through Taoism, and I can come through being a Hindu, or I can come through being an atheist, or I can come through being a Christian or a Mormon. And, but we all end up in the same place. And what I'm saying is, no, King Benjamin taught an explicitly different doctrine, didn't he? He said that salvation rests only in 
and through the name Jesus Christ. Christ says, I am the, tru- the way, the truth, and the life. The way, not one of the, right? And so Christ is at the heart uh, of salvation. Without Christ, there is no salvation. And now, obviously, that implies that there is no salvation without the atonement, right? And I think what we would do here is probably go to 2 Nephi chapter 9, which has some interesting... uh, This is the, in my opinion, the best passage that we have on actually describing the doctrine of the atonement. Um, It's just beautiful language, sublime language, and Jacob is the one teaching here. Um, And we won't spend too much time here because we'd go down a rabbit hole and never come out. But let's let's look at at 2 Nephi 9, which speaks about the infinite atonement, infinite in its time, infinite in its essence, it's, it's retroactive, it's... Uh, it, it go, and because the being who uh, perpetuates the atonement is an infinite uh, being. He's the Son of God. Um, and note what happens if there had been no atonement, what happens? Verse 9. Our spirits must have become like the devil. All right? So, had there been no atonement, there's two options here. And they both deal with this concept of assimilation. Had there been no atonement, what's your destiny, Jacob says? Our spirits... Let's begin in verse 8. Oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy and grace. For if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to the angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God, and became the devil to rise no more. And our spirits must have become like unto him, to be shut out of the presence of God forever. All right? So in the absence of an atonement, in the absence of a Savior, it's a pretty grim destination. All right? Um, Well... You say, well, that's not really fair. I'm not a devil. I don't have those proclivities. I don't have that inclination. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, what happens in a hopeless state? It's a downward spiral. It's nihilism. There's, uh, there's no hope. Where there is no hope, uh, it's just absolute chaos. I remember reading in the Mortal Messiah series, and the reason I remember this is because it's on page 666 of the, of the Mortal Messiah series, and it talks about this idea that Satan wasn't up there really saying, I'm going to make everyone just be really good. He was saying, you do whatever you want, and still end up like God. And that just fundamental it's a philosophical impossibility. It doesn't work, you see. And so what Elder McConkie does on that page is he says, had Satan's plan actually been implemented, it wouldn't have been this panacea. It would have been absolute chaos and disorder. He says there would have been murder and mayhem and everything. And that's what happens when there is no atonement. You see, there was no alternative plan of salvation that would have worked. It wasn't like we were taking a vote on which plan could happen. The father presents his plan and the son sustains it. All right? So it's about this issue of assimilation. What will you become to assimilate, to become? And Joseph Smith says, on the other end of this is, let's see. Page two. Speaking of the nature of salvation, the prophet taught that it was to be like unto Christ. And he was like the Father, the great prototype of all saved beings. And for any portion of the human family to be assimilated into their likeness and to be unlike them, or no, is to be saved. And to be unlike them is to be destroyed. And on this hinge turns the door of salvation. What's he saying there? Assimilation. We become like Christ. 
You see, what Christ does is he brings us to him, and then he brings us to the Father. That's, that's what he does. And he said, what, what does he say? When he shall appear, we shall be like him, the sanctified, and shall see him as he is. There will be... There, that's not to say we are at his level. That's to say that there is a relationship there, an awareness, a perception of his light. And your, what you put off will be an expression of your own sanctification, the life that you've lived. I almost don't even think, I mean, it's not like you've got to open the big book and go through all the details of judgment. You just look at a person, if you're God, and you know you can see the evidence of their life in the light that they possess. Well, there's this idea of assimilation. On the one hand, no atonement. We assimilate into something that is despair. On the other hand, we can become like unto God. Joseph Smith uses the concept of a prototype. He says, how do we know how to become like God? Well, you start by finding a saved being. And then you say, how do I become like that being? Where is the great prototype? A prototype is a model. Some that you can follow. So one of our revelations says that salvation is dispensed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means you go follow what the Savior did, and you take upon you his gospel, and that is the path towards salvation. So we'll take another definition here and talk about the gospel brings us to salvation, because it's the path. Um, all right, what else would we say, just definitionally, definitionally about uh, what does it mean to be saved? What are we missing? Anything? Any comments or questions? What else is a saved being? How else do you define salvation? How else do the revelations define uh, salvation? Well, one thing it does is it says that salvation is a gift, right? Uh, I think you've got DNC 6 and you've got DNC 14.7, which describes it as a gift. And then it also says that it is, quote, the greatest of all the gifts of God. Now, what is that? What does that tell you about our Heavenly Father? He wants us back. It says that he's generous. Yeah. He not only wants us to be like him, he wants us to have ultimate joy. Think about that for a minute. For a minute. How many leaders strongest leaders in the history of the earth have said, I want to take all the power that I have and give it to everybody. That's, that's a foreign thought. It's all about power consolidation, you know, keeping people out. Um, and frankly, that's ungodly, Right? What's really unique about even the, the concept of priesthood to the Latter-day Saints is that there is a democratization of priesthood, if you will. It wasn't about just keeping it with, the, with a, 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 a small group of people. It was about extend, extending the blessings of the priesthood to every 12-year-old boy who's, you know, who desires it, worthy of it. So there's something about God, this being a gift, that speaks to his nature. In fact, uh, what does Nephi say? He says, salvation is... Fill in the blank. What is it? Free. How is salvation free? Is it really free? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's let's pick that up. So the comment here is that the 50th section of the Doctrine and Covenants talks about that, that, none that none that are given to God shall be lost. Let's expand. We, we would have to expand the definition of salvation. Um, 
and I'm, I'm not going to put it over here. Let's go, let's go here. Salvation has many uh, uses. Primarily, when we read about the word salvation in the scriptures, we mean exaltation. Those are the same concepts, usually. But there are a few instances where salvation means something other than exaltation. What do we mean by exaltation, brothers and sisters? Being raised as high as you can go, becoming like God which means you share the kind of life that he lives, which means you dwell in the family unit, which means that you possess all the thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and so on and so forth that he possesses. That's exaltation. Um, and we, we could pick this up in the 130th section. We'll, we, we'll read that. But, but there are other places where salvation has a different definition. Yeah. Well, the resurrection is related. Let's pick it up in section 76. This is the grand vision. And uh, Joseph has received this remarkable vision. You probably remember that Sidney Rigdon is there seeing the vision with him. And you recall what happens? Sidney's up on the stand and Joseph's there. One of the things you've got to love about the prophet Joseph Smith is he introduces his angels to other people. All right? There's just witness after witness. What did we say? There were 17 people who saw, claimed to have seen Moroni. 17? This thing was not done in a corner. All right? And here you got not only Joseph and Sidney who are receiving this revelation, you have a bunch of the elders here who are observing it. And it's a series of visions, much like section 138, Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead uh, in the spirit world. And it, it's a series. It's like you take a remote control and you're changing the channel. All right? So Joseph is seeing and Sidney are seeing um, outer darkness and the celestial kingdom and the terrestrial kingdom and the telestial kingdom. All right? And after this happens, Sidney's wiped out. It's like Moses in front of the Lord on the mountain. He, he comes, he's just, he's depleted of energy. And Joseph, do you remember what Joseph says? You'll have to forgive Brother Sidney. He's not as used to it as I am. Okay? <laughs> so there's something about this uh, endurance that you build up by having those type of experiences that Joseph uh, appreciated. Now, we, um, let's pick this up. If you were to look at the first 40 or so verses, the first oh, 20 verses or an introduction, and in verse 30, you begin the vision of perdition. There's 19 verses that deal with perdition. And, Ray, it's a little depressing. All right? So we're not going to read that. Um, but you notice that in verse 42, it speaks, well, in verse 41, it speaks about Christ, once again, being crucified for the sins of the world. And he comes to sanctify the world and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness. That through him all might be saved. How many? Whom the Father had put in his power and made by him. All right, so there's a qualifier there, but look at verse 43. Who glorifies the Father and saves all the works of his hands, except those sons of perdition who deny the Son and the Father has re uh, after the Father has revealed him. Wherefore, he saves all except them. Now we have just broadened the definition of salvation. What did you just learn there? To whom does salvation go? All but perdition. Is there salvation for those in the telestial kingdom? Yes. Is there salvation for those in the terrestrial kingdom? Yes. Is it the same type of salvation for those in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom? No. So what is it? Saved from what? 
back to 2 Nephi 9, saved from death, saved from hell, and saved from the devil. That's the language of the Revelation. They're saved from death, they're saved from hell, uh, they're saved from the devil, and uh, that condition exists in the telestial world. That reality exists in the terrestrial world. Now, for those in the telestial kingdom, they will have to go pay the utmost farthing. In We've spoken in a couple, pre- previous class about Hades and Sheol and the world of departed spirits, and, and there will be a price to be paid, but there is saving from that. There's a degree of salvation from that. And Christ and the Father offer that to all, except this cast of perdition, which is a hard and a a difficult state. And frankly, I think that one people choose, they have to deliberately choose. All right. So now I say this as a tangent, but frankly, this definition of salvation is the minority. What you just read and what you saw in section 50, verse 42, is speaking of things uh, in a much more liberal definition of salvation than what the scriptures normally do. Normally, when we read the word salvation, we mean exaltation. That's what, that's what the scriptures normally mean. And so, we just have a little definitional problem. It's like, what does soul mean? Well, it depends. Depends what the verse is talking about, right? And so I think that's just important to, make, to maybe highlight. But I think we should also say, this is a very liberal and expansive view of who God is. Once again, you will find the theme of his generosity, his compassion, his uh, willingness to, to, to save his children is extremely liberal. How many people will be perdition? Well, not very many. Not very many. I guess there was a third part, wasn't there? I don't know how, how big that was. Yeah, Bill. No. Yeah, so Bill's question is, if you go out and get a testimony, you go on a mission, and, and you feel the Holy Ghost, and you come back, and you leave the church and have your name removed from the records of the church, are you perdition? And the answer is no. Uh, frankly, I, I remember that very thing on my mission. There was a young elder who was really afraid, and he was like living the mission rules. He was trying to do everything right, but he's like, I think I denied the Spirit. Am I going to be cast out forever? Um, and unwittingly, that's a actually very precocious thing to even think. Because you've got to have, st- in the words of Joseph Smith, stared at the sun as if at noonday, and then denied that Jesus is the Christ. To qualify for the denying of the Holy Ghost. And he takes it a step further in the 132nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants where he says that you also have to ascend afresh to the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to be in that throng of people who would say, crucify him, crucify him. After having been fully illuminated. Well, what does fully illuminated mean? Joseph Smith says that means you literally have Christ appear to you or you have a sure knowledge. All right? So that's quite a requirement to obtain that, uh, uh, you know, perdition. Yeah, Ron? You know, there are, you know, Ron brings up, for those on Zoom who couldn't hear, he brings up Judas, and we could go through Cain and others. I mean, my Uncle Joseph used to teach that Cain had actually had his calling and election, and then he denied, all right? And, that, and when he's cast out, he says, I cannot bear being cast out of your presence. Um, so this is an exceptional class. This is something that I don't think return missionaries probably need to be worrying about too much. Um, but the question does come up, Bill, and I think it's a fair a uh, fair thing to consider. Um, but when we speak about salvation generally, we're talking about exaltation. 
we're talking about bring, being brought into the presence of God and living the type of life that he lives. All right? Well, what else would we say? Who is it available to? What does the uh, third article of faith say? You could probably quote that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the question is, you know, Christ says to the Pharisees that only my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And the question is, is that who he's looking for? Look, uh, I, I, this, this leads in perfectly to what I think I was, uh, where I was going, which is, let's just read it from the, th well, from the third article of faith, what does it say? We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and principles and ordinances of the gospel, all right? We believe that who? All mankind may be saved. Again, generosity. We believe, we're running out of room. We believe that all mankind has the potential to assimilate in the likeness of God. That is an expansive idea. Again, that's a liberal idea. Oh, I say liberal, I mean expansive. I'm not talking politics. <laughs> I'm talking about how, you know, you come through the tradition, much of the Protestant tradition that says, Calvinism, predestination, there's, a, there's the, only those who are elected before you even came to earth have a shot. God has already picked his elect. That's not who our father is. Yeah, Rudy. Isn't there a condition to be saved? Absolutely. Or made to be saved, and that's really... That's right. He says, isn't there a condition? Of course there's a condition. And what is the condition? It's based on you. You choose. I, I really believe that, brothers and sisters. If you were to look at the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, there's a law given to every kingdom. And he who cannot abide a celestial law will not inherit a celestial glory. And he who cannot abide a terrestrial law shall not abide or inherit a terrestrial glory. That's what the Revelation says, right, in section 88. All right? So, yeah, there are conditions to this salvation, absolutely. Uh, uh, what are those conditions? Well, we could, we could spend a lot of time on that, but I think we've got a question here. As far as has been revealed, and I caveat it that way, because that's the way that the, the prophets have caveated that. There's just not a lot revealed about perdition. As far as has been revealed, uh, we would expect no redemption. You go read the 76th section and you'll see that. Um, so as far as has been, but frankly, it, it is such a minority that have to worry about this that the Lord has not been expansive in, in revealing it. A third does not mean 33%. And that's the premortal spirits. I'm not talking about those who are here. And by the way, the scriptures to the premortal people would be different than the scriptures that come to us. It's for their time and their place, right? And so what we're concerned about is our sphere of existence here in mortality. And thus, the scriptures that come to us are specific to what we can do in this sphere of action. Um, you know, but a third part is what the Revelation says. It's not 33.3% repeating. I don't know how big that number was. We don't know. I imagine it's significant. You know, I imagine it's significant. Um, all right. Where were we? Um, let's go to 88. This is good stuff. Let's go to 88. Talking about terms and conditions and this sort of thing. Um... And let's pick up the story here. We've quoted some of this. There's a, let's draw the context of section 88 for a minute. This is remarkable stuff. 
It's talking about light and truth and law. Light and truth and law. And the Lord takes the, the light of Christ and expands our understanding about what that is. We spoke a little about that last week. And he basically says that all light and truth and knowledge come from the source of light, which is God. Remember that he says the light that you see and perceive comes from God. It's the light of the sun and the light of the moon and the light of the stars and so on and so forth. Um, that's, and then he goes on to describe this world that we live on will receive a degree of salvation, if you will. It will be resurrected, it will be glorified, it will be exalted. And it will be a place for the inhabitants of, uh, the, of a celestial kingdom. And then he speaks here, uh, I think, on Rudy, to your point, about the terms and condition of those who would inherit the kingdom. Verse 21. And they who are not sanctified through the law which I have given unto you, even the law of Christ, that's what we're going to call it. We're going to call this thing the law of Christ, must inherit another kingdom, even that of a terrestrial or a celestial kingdom. And then it goes through and it says what I had quoted previously. If you can't abide a terrestrial law, you can't inherit a terrestrial glory and so on and so forth. So, the language of this revelation says, you must do what? You must live or abide the law of Christ. And if you do not, you cannot inherit his kingdom. Right? Well, what is the law of Christ? Yeah. There are covenant relationship. A covenant relationship is certainly involved in the law of Christ. Maybe what we do, instead of just taking, you know, maybe let's read with greater specificity in the 76th section, which defines concept upon concept, who receives eternal life in the celestial kingdom? And what are the requirements? So, let's go back to section 76. And if you go to verses uh, 50 to 70, you now see, again, here's, here's Joseph Smith being shown by a remote control. He's switching visions. And he's now going into the celestial, those who receive the celestial kingdom, beginning in verse 50. And again we bear record, for we saw and heard, and this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ, concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. Who comes forth in the resurrection of the just? That's a, that's a synonym for those who are saved. All right? What did they do to qualify? I've got six or seven things here. Number one, they are they who received the testimony of Jesus. All right? They receive the testimony of Christ. Now, what does it mean to receive? Does it mean you let the elders in for a few minutes and they bore a testimony and you never thought about it again? What does it mean to actually receive? Well... We could expand that, but I think you get my point. There's quite a bit involved in, in the reception of testimony. Number two, and believed on his name. All right? Believed on Christ's name. And when you believe on Christ's name, you believe on his authority. Name is synonymous with authority in the scriptures. And you believe on those who come in his name, right? Whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. So, those who receive the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and what? Number three. And are baptized. 
Those who were baptized. Now that is lofty company uh, with these other principles. Baptism is, in fact, what we would say, uh, what I've heard uh, taught, is that baptism is the ordinance of salvation. All right? And then we can make a little distinction where we say that celestial marriage is the ordinance of exaltation. And now again, we're doing something definitionally. Usually, salvation means exaltation in the scriptures. But this concept uh, adds one more layer of understanding that we'll get to uh, in a moment when we get into uh, the 132nd section. But what that's saying is that baptism opens the door for the path that leads to salvation. If you never go through that door, the path is not available to you. All right? Exaltation, we could say the same thing, ultimately, for the sealing ordinance. Now it can be made available in the next world. Yes, we can talk about that. That's going to happen. Uh, but come soon or come late, those ordinances are required living. All right? Now, what else? What comes next? After they're baptized after the manner of his burial. So someone said by immersion. That's right. He's got to be baptized the proper way. And this according to the commandment which he has given. That, by keeping the commandments, all right? There's number four. Do you get baptized and say, hey, we're done. It's all good. We're done. No. You've got to keep the commandments. We call it enduring to the end, right? I love going to the 17th branch in our stake, the assisted living facility, because I see these people who are bent over with age, and I see endurance in them. I see lasting commitment. Uh, it's a terribly moving thing to be there and to see this kind of faith that just keeps on enduring. Um, well, that's a requ let's remind ourselves what we're doing. We are going through what the Revelation says are the requirements for those who will inherit the celestial kingdom. Now, the other thing I want to do is, is for you to contemplate for a moment. As I read these, I want you to say, can I do that? Is that accessible to me? Because sometimes we worry ourselves a little bit too much. Sometimes we say, I sin so much and I am just so unlike God that I can never obtain this. And I think that, uh, I think God's not pleased with that kind of thinking. I think he wants us to feel the achievability of his promise. Will God fail in his work, brothers and sisters? For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. I would suggest he's good at his job. I would suggest that he's good at his job and that he wants us back and that he's laid out a plan that is achievable does not require perfection, does not require perfection, requires striving, requires repentance. All right? All right, let's keep going. Verse 52, it's those who keep the commandments that they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins. And now, number five, receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed under this power. So what else has to happen? Baptized and you get the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, that makes sense. Joseph says you might as well baptize a bag of sand, if not with the intention of getting the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, so this is laid out as a criterion. And then, and whoso overcome by faith, and I would say that's kind of like that enduring, enduring to the end, and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Again, we have a definition. We've got to be, have our ordinances sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the ratifying seal of approval. It's the Lord, it's the Holy Ghost, 
and the Lord, stamping that ordinance. Yes, the baptism counts. Yes, the sealing works. All right? It's that sealing stamp of approval. The Holy Spirit of promise, which is the Holy Ghost promising that this ordinance will be honored in this world and in the next. You see? That has to happen as well. Now, after all of these conditions that we've read, after we receive the testimony of Christ, after we believe on the name of Christ, after we're baptized and receive the Holy Ghost, after we strive to keep the commandments, and after the Holy Spirit of promise ratifies our ordinances, then what? Verse 54. The people in that category, they are they who are the church of the firstborn. They are those who are of the church of the firstborn. Now we have another definition. The church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn. Joseph Fielding Smith says that there will be many people who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, on the records of the church who are not members of the church of the firstborn. Because maybe one of those, several of those requirements they let go of, you see. Um, church of the firstborn are those who are invited into his kingdom uh, and maintain that covenant relationship. All right, the bride and the bridegroom, that, that covenant relationship is maintained in the hereafter. And here's what they're like. They are they into whose hands the Father has given what? All things. All things. Again, expansive generosity. They are they who are priests and kings, and I would add priestesses and queens, who have received of his fullness and his glory, and are priests of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch. All right? Wherefore, verse 58, it is written, what? They are gods. They are gods. That's this theosis. That's them becoming like God. They are gods, says the Revelation. All right? Um, well, again, I ask you, is that achievable? I think you could look at that and say, yeah. I think that is achievable. That's something that, that's something that I can do. That's something that I can do. Um, well, what else do we want to do here? Um, let's teach a couple more principles. One of them, I, well, I, I think this is really special. Let's go to the 137th section, and then maybe we'll finish in 132. 137th section is a revelation that was not put into our canon until, you know, a hundred years after Joseph Smith actually uh, received this revelation. This was added much, much later. Um, if memory serves, I think this was added in the late 1970s, early 81 edition of the, of the, of the Doctrine and Covenants, all right? Um, and what it is, is a vision that is recorded that the prophet Joseph Smith receives um, in Kirtland, Ohio on January the 21st, 1836. If you look at the date of that, you'll realize that this is right when the Kirtland Temple is nearing completion. It will be dedicated in April. Uh, and that the, the, the brethren are in an upper room in the temple. And it's when uh, the prophet Joseph Smith gives his father, Joseph Smith Sr., a blessing and tells him that he will be the patriarch of the church. Uh, and it's a terribly moving experience. Uh, and in fact, there uh, uh, he stands up and prophesies. Uh, and it's the beginnings of the washings and anointings in the church that would become the initiatory, all right? So all of this happens in that meeting. And in that context... Joseph has a 
Syriac experience where the veil is parted and he, and he peers into the celestial kingdom. It wasn't the first time. He had had this experience before. But here he has it again. And here's what we learn. The heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God and the glory thereof, whether in the body uh, or out, I cannot tell. That's a, that's, a Paul, that's a phrase that Paul uses. I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, which was like unto circling flames of fire. All right, that's a metaphor. He's trying to find language to describe the glory of this place. All right. Also the blazing throne of God, whereupon was seated the Father and the Son. Joseph Smith sees this. I saw the beautiful streets of that kingdom, which had the appearance of being paved with gold. I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father, and my mother, and my brother Alvin that has long since slept. Now what's peculiar about that description, brothers and sisters? Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mack are sitting right next to him. I mean, I don't know if Lucy was there, but they're alive. All right? So what is Joseph seeing? He's seeing a future vision. All things are present before me, God. I mean, all time is measured unto man, and, but... God is, 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 sees all things at once, all right? That's what's going on here. And, and Joseph is seeing a future vision. And you'll see that he's surprised by what he sees, right? Verse 6. And I marveled. That means I'm like surprised. How it was that he, meaning Alvin, his brother, had obtained an inheritance in that kingdom, seeing that he had, law, that he had departed this life before the Lord had set his hand to gather Israel the second time, and had not been baptized for the remission of sins. Joseph is learning something here. He's confused. Wait, I thought baptism was required. At this point in time, does he know anything about baptism for the dead? No. That doctrine has not been revealed. And so he's, that's a hard, think about the freeing uh, mentality of that doctrine, vicarious work for the dead. Joseph Smith marvels. Wait, how is he there? Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it, if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. All right? All who have died without a knowledge, who would have received it, Well, who knows who would have received it? Only the perfect judge. Only the perfect judge knows who would have received it. But but that should give a lot of people hope. Right? It doesn't mean that they'll just skip over and hop right in the celestial kingdom. They've got to learn the doctrines and principles. They'll have access to be taught those in the spirit world. That they might be, according to their... Revelation, judged according to men in the flesh, on the same standard as you and I, but they will have that opportunity. And the Lord's teaching Joseph Smith this principle. Also that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. And then he takes it one step further, and he says that all the children who die before the age of accountability will be heirs of that kingdom. So what have we just done to the doctrine of who gets saved? One more time, we've expanded it. We've enlarged it. And what we're saying is that God looks at motive. He looks at what you would have done had you had the opportunity. And to me, that is a beautiful thing. The Lord looks at what you would have done had you had the opportunity. We call this, I associate this with the law of compensation. And it applies in many, many ways. I had a cousin who died at the age of 27. His wife, you know, they were recently married. They had one small child. And um, 
my uncle Joseph stood up at their funeral and he read from this scripture and he says that the Lord has the ability to compensate people for things that they actually didn't accomplish because things outside of their control prohibited their access to the same blessings that were afforded to others. That is a very uh, comforting doctrine. It's a very comforting doctrine this law of compensation. Well, I never had the chance to get married. I really didn't. Or my husband or wife was killed. Or we were divorced, but I I wanted that marriage and I fought for it. Or I had mental handicaps or emotional trials or any number of obstacles that stood before your path. And I think what the Lord is teaching is that he will compensate and that he will honor the divine motives of those who desired righteousness. And isn't that a glorious thing? That's just a glorious thing. I want you guys to realize what I'm saying today. This Latter-day Saint theology is extremely expansive. And it is very liberal in the sense that God is generous and he wants to save his children. And I've taken our doctrine this morning and you compare it to any other Protestant or Catholic or Christian faith and you line up where the possibility of salvation rests and you will find that the doctrine that Joseph Smith restored is truly expansive. The Lord is generous and he will not fail in his work. The King Follett Discourse. Teaches a great deal about the history of God. Bottom of page three. God himself was once as we are now. And is an exalted man. He's an exalted man. Man. What's his name? It's got lots of names. One is Elohim. But what does Enoch say his name is? Man of holiness. Man of holiness. I'm emphasizing the man. Again, that's approachable. I may be wrong about this, but I think it's John Taylor who's on the mission in France. Again, I'm a little foggy, I didn't prepare this, but he's having a debate with a minister about the nature of God. And this man just excoriates John Taylor and says, uh, you know, God's going to strike you down for your understanding of who he is. And John Taylor says, that's just fine with me, for your God has no hand with which to strike me, no tongue with which to rebuke me, no eyes with which to see me, no voice with which to excoriate me, this sort of thing. What's he teaching? He's teaching the doctrine of exalted man. We are made in the image of God. We look like him, right? And so, we see that he's an exalted man. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit, and who upholds all worlds, and all things by his power, was made visible, to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him in the form of a man. Like yourself in all person, image, the very form as a man. And Adam, for Adam was created in the very fashion, image and likeness of God, and received instruction from, and walked and talked and conversed with him, as one man talks and communes with another. All right? That tells you something about, again, the nature of God. Now, um, let's read one more passage. King Fault's discourse obviously is quite uh, lengthy, and I've just taken a few passages here. Um, come down to the bolded heading there, Joseph Smith, King Fault Discourse, section 5. Here, then, is eternal life. That's what we're dealing with today. How do you obtain eternal life? 
to know the only wise and true God. What's Joseph Smith doing there? Pop quiz. Where's he getting that reference from? That's John 17. Joseph's quoting John 17. To know the only wise and true God. And you have got to learn how to be gods yourself. And to be kings and priests to God. The same as all gods have done before you. What? All gods have done before you? All right. All gods? What we're doing, we, we talk about this portion of the King Follow Discourse as expanding upon the concept of the plurality of gods. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, but it expands beyond that. And uh, that's what the prophet is teaching. The same as all gods have done before you, namely, by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until, until something happens. Until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings. He says you've got to be able to dwell in everlasting burnings, meaning light and glory. He's not going to say it's fire and hot. He's just saying it's going to be a really glorified place. And you've got to be able to withstand it. That happens because your body is brought forth out of the grave in a condition to absorb that light. All right? You're resurrected with a celestial body. That's, that's, that's Corinthians 15, right? That's 1 Corinthians 15. It talks about the, the bodies of celestial and terrestrial and celestial. Uh, and that's really what's happening here in, uh, in Philippians that talks about, this is again a New Testament doctrine, you should be brought back with the body like God's. We ought to read it. I'm paraphrasing that and probably not doing a very good job. Um, look at Philippians uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 21. Who shall change our vile body? Wow, I didn't think my body was that bad. But Who shall change our vile body? Some days, yeah. <laughs> that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So here's a biblical passage saying there's the potential to fashion this body like unto his glorious body. What's a glorious body, brothers and sisters? One that possesses glory. One that can absorb glory. One that if you were to stand in the presence of, would require your transfiguration so that you weren't consumed by his glory. All right? When Christ come again with the resurrected saints, says section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the, he will come in his glory. And what will be the result of that? Fire and destruction for those who are not changed. So this is a lot of glory we're talking about. All right? So... And, yeah, we don't have time. Section 88, verse 67 is beautiful. It talks about those bodies having light. And because they have light, they have access to two things. A fullness of joy and omniscience. That's 88, 67. So write that one down. 88, 67. You know, you have a fullness of joy and you have uh, omniscience because of the light that your body, your resurrected body possesses, all right? Now, back to Joseph Smith and the King Follow Discourse. Middle of the passage. By going from one small degree to another and from some small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you attained the resurrection of the dead, you were able to dwell in everlasting burnings, that's where we left it, and to sit in glory, as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. And I want you to know that God, in the last days, while certain individuals are pro proclaiming his name, 
is not trifling with you or I. Now, I, I like that. Joseph Smith says he's not tri- trifling with you or me. Translation, he believes you can become all of that. And he expects it. And he'll help you along the way. All right? Um, well, if you were to stare into heaven, you would know more about that place than by reading all the books in the libraries. We have a prophet of the dispensation who stared into heaven and who spoke with exalted men, with glorified, exalted, celestialized beings. And they looked like him. And they spoke. And they had great power and glory. Joseph thought the leaves of the trees were going to consume when God's presence was there. I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the noonday sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. All right? One of them spake unto me and calling me by name, calling me by name and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him. That's the witness of a man who saw glorified beings. It's the witness of a man who observed salvation, who observed what it meant to be exalted, and then who, day after day, translated or received revelations that expanded our view and taught us that that same privilege can be afforded to you and I as his children, as the offspring of God. It's a grand thought, and it's one that will take us much learning and time and progress before we're able to comprehend. But I'm grateful for the inclinations that we have. I'm grateful for the doctrines that have been restored. And I know that they're truth. They're true, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.